song tonight. It's so new, in fact, that not even the whole band has heard it yet, so just, it's not that new. Hey, but it's a song. Uh, it's taken from this story that Jesus told, might be familiar to you, about this amazing, amazing father whose son got to this point and said, you know, I think I could do better on my own. And so he left. He found out that that wasn't true. Um, and he had this great idea to return back home. And he thought to himself that, you know, maybe, maybe there's a small chance that I'll be accepted if I come in and just not, in, not intend to come back as a son, but just to come back as a servant. And he walks down the road, and as Jesus is telling the story, he says, when he was a long way off. Man, I have always loved that line. When he was a long way off, the father saw him, and he ran to him. And not only would he hear none of this servant stuff, but he didn't even let him get a word in because he immediately began to restore him. And you know, it, it is often the case when we've blown it or we've messed up 
that we think I might be accepted, but we expect some kind of harsh words of criticism. But there were no harsh words of criticism from this father. There was nothing but kindness that he showed to his son that had been away. He hadn't become something else. He had remained his son the whole time. So this song is about that. Uh, the chorus goes like this. I'll sing it for you. I have heard this one. Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown. I call you Father, you call me your own. And when I have wanted, you've welcomed me home with nothing but kindness. Maybe we could try that today. Nothing but kindness is all that you've shown. I call you Father, you call me your own. And when I have wanted, you've welcomed me home with nothing but kindness. Nothing but kindness. Nothing but kindness.
of every song we could ever sing Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever be We live for you Oh, we live for you And holy Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
bow with me as we pray together? Oh Lord, we want to start off by just saying thank you, thank you, thank you so much that you have led us into this life uh, that is a life where we're grounded. Lord, in this world where oftentimes we can look out and it just seems like things are so uncertain and so out of control, Lord, you lead us into this life, God, that is based on your firm foundation for us so we won't be shaken, so we can be under your leadership, God, and you could lead us uh, to love those around us, Lord. And we are trusting that the time that we're going to spend together with you today is going to move us one step closer uh, to that reality of making us into these loving people uh, that know how to love with our actions and also with our words. And so, Lord, we are trusting uh, that you'll lead us into this moment and teach us and be with us. And so we just give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. We want to say thanks for being with us today. Uh, we love seeing you all here, so thanks for joining us. If you're watching online, we appreciate you as well. But we want to welcome you to Terra Nova. My name's Scott. This guy is Lyle. Say hey, Lyle. There you go. You guys did really well with that. Hey, hey if you happen to be brand new to Terra Nova and uh, it's one of your first times joining us, we just always love saying thanks for that. Uh, we just picture it as like, man, you, it's a gift to have you hang with us this weekend. And so we hope you have a great experience and, uh, and really enjoy your time with us. So thanks so much for everybody being a part of what we're doing this weekend. Yeah, Scott, we're grateful for everybody being here, either in person or online. Also really excited about diving into part three of our series. Our series called Speak Life. And I, I know that it's been attracting a bunch of us because yeah. for a bunch of us, you know, we're really looking to uh, live the kind of life where we're able to say the right things at the right time and not only uh, benefiting from God's guidance with the way that we speak, but also with the way that we listen. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's kind of hard for me sometimes, so uh, maybe other people relate. We're going to have a good time with that today, and we're actually going to spend a moment playing a little game, okay? Yeah, I so heard you got a game cooked this, up for us. This is, I am the guy of games, so we're going to have some fun. Uh, if you don't want to have fun, man, that's rough for you because there's going to be a that's lot of it right now. Uh, it's a game you've probably heard of or played before, maybe if you didn't even know the name of the game. It's called Mad Gab, and here's how the game works is in a moment, there's going to be a phrase that pops up on our screens. You're going to see it and be like, that doesn't make any sense. But as we read it, you're going to listen and you're going to hear what it's actually trying to say, okay? And so here's how the game is going to work. We've got two teams. Uh, team number one is going to be Lyle. All right. So Lyle's on team number one. Team number two is going to be all y'all. Hey, okay? wait a minute. Yeah. So it feel, feels like the odds are stacked a bit against me, Scott. Maybe. So like, how does that work? You're sharp, Lyle. Okay. So, yeah. so, but I am not to be intimidated, Scott. You won't be. Yeah. Because I'm a gamer, be. Scott. I'm going to bring my game tonight. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how this okay. goes. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So it, look, we're going to kick it off with, with a sample. Okay. So we'll pop it up. We'll read it. And the first team to shout out the correct answer gets it. This one says, Mar thus do hurt. Mar thus do hurt. Anybody got it? Mar thus to her. Martha. There we go. Martha Mar Stewart. Shoot. Now, with, yeah, with some conviction in your voice, right. Carol. Love that. Okay, okay, Scott, I'm already trailing. Okay, so that's okay. That was is, practice. That was practice. All right, it was we a practice three one. Three rounds. So we're, we're going quickly. So we're still even. Though. Yeah, so if, if you're slow, okay, okay, catch up. Okay, let's go to the, the first one. All right. These, These tars, tars bang, bang geld, pan her. her. These, These tars, tars bang, bang geld, pan her. These tars, bang geld, pan her. There we go. Scott, there's a ringer in the audience. Team two's got Carol. Are you so, sure that you didn't put a plant in the audience? This because, is the only plant I brought. Okay, okay so, all right. Oh, yeah, that's plant. All right, okay. so we've got, I got one for team two. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's check it out. Fee Nix, Harry's Phoenix owner. Over. Okay, Lyle. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So we got, we got one last one. Okay. Let him get it. Okay. Right. One last one. Okay, I, I can't get blank, Scott. Okay, it we'll can't see. be a shutout. We'll see. So I got to get this one. You can't? Okay, okay, let's see it. Last one. It is Canoe Key Pit. Canoe Key Pit, who years elf. Canoe Key Pit, who years elf. Canoe Key Pit, who years elf. Oh. oh that's kind of messed up for you to say that. But yeah, yeah. Can you keep it to yourself? There you go. We got it. So here's the thing. He's never seen this before, but when we do it at the 9.30 and the 11, hopefully. Scott, hopefully. I'll be crushing it. <laughs> I'll be crushing it yeah, at the 9.30 and 11, we'll, so we'll you see. might want to come back for that okay. one. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. That's when I'll extract my sweet revenge. Yeah. Let's give it up for Lyle. Yeah. Give it up for Lyle. Thank you very much. 
I got and give point. it up for yourselves, you guys. There you go. Hey, uh, it's it's definitely not always not always easy to listen, right? Not always easy to hear what's really being said. So uh, we'll get we'll get into that a little bit more later on. But again, we're thankful that you're hanging with us this weekend. Uh, if you came in and you got a program. Go ahead, pull it out. You'll notice on the very front of that, kind of clip to the front, we've got a business card for this great thing that we're kicking off a week from Monday. It's called our Neighborhood Dinners. And this is just kind of where we're opening our building to anybody in the community, anybody in the neighborhood who, who wants a meal, who wants to, uh, to be part of a conversation. So we'd invite you or anybody you know to come out for that. You can read the back of the program for more information on that. As you open your program, you're gonna see a lot of things, including what we've got going on next weekend. Kids Feeding Kids, that's one weekend away. Uh, but the first thing we wanna have you do is to open up your program or open up the Terranova app, and uh, you're gonna find the Connect card at the very, very back. And Law, you can tell them what to do with this guy. Yeah, so uh, the Connect card is great. And we'd love to have everybody uh, fill us out really every time that we meet. Uh, you can go ahead and put your name on it and then just check in with us. Prayer requests, we'd love to pray for a prayer request if you have one. If you've got a question about anything, go ahead and write that down. We'll do our best to answer that. Uh, you might wanna write a word of update. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we just would love to have everybody just connect using the Connect card. They can use this paper one, yep. or also some people prefer to use the Terranova app on My their phone. There's the high tech yeah. people, Scott. Yeah. yeah, they'll do that. So uh, we'd love to have everybody take a little bit of time, whether you're online or in person, working on this and getting it to to us. And uh, so you've got that. And those of you that are here in person, you'll also notice not only we got the Connect card, but we also got this giving envelope uh, that helps you with your giving. You can use this, or you can also use your app, right? Absolutely. And uh, I, one of the things that we just kind of notice is that as we are aware of this opportunity to give each and every week, it's, it's really this exercise that we get to take part of. It's an exercise of going, hey, I wanna be this person who is a generous person who is looking out for the needs of others. It's also an exercise uh, where we're recognizing that everything we have comes from God. And so we get to steward that and look after it and be generous with that. But it's also this way where we get to remember that together as a community, we get to do so much more. We get to make such a bigger impact together with our resources, with our gifts, with everything God's given us than we could ever make on our own. And it's been great seeing that uh, happen. And uh, we just love making God's love famous, not as individuals, but as a community. And so I would encourage you, if you're part of the Terranova family, to jump in to that opportunity to give. Yeah, so uh, as they're working on those things, Scott, there's one more thing in the program that I would love everybody to pull out and take a look at. And that's our life group brochure yeah. because, Scott, I am fired up for life groups. I know you are. Yeah, it, because life groups are going to be starting in the next week or the next two weeks. And so we're just getting going. And I'm really passionate about getting everybody into a group, yep. Scott. Yep. And I, I got to tell you that, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different groups that are in this uh, life group brochure. But I want to lock down on a, on a whole category of groups so that I can... Describe with using just one word, Scott. You know what the word is? Not yet. Accessible. Oh. The accessible groups. Word. Because here's the thing, is that we've decided to put some of our best groups on the day that almost everybody has off, and that's Saturday, Scott. That's true. So if you want to go ahead and open up your life group or show, you'll see the Saturday groups, and, uh, and these are the groups that are accessible. People got the day off, they can join these groups. We got a, a men's group that meets here at the Hub. That's also accessible because people know how to get here. Yep. Led by Kevin Casper, we've got a mountain bike group that's going on as well. Uh, people uh, riding their bikes. People of all mountain bike skills can participate, yeah. although I think we're going to have to draw the line if you have like a beach cruiser or a stingray. You probably can't participate if that's your bike. But everything else, good to go. Uh, we've got a women's running group that happens on Saturday. Scott, can you imagine tearing over women running through the hills of Mission Viejo like a, like a flock of gazelles? That's wonderful. Yeah, it's going to be a beautiful thing, Scott. And then we've also, on Saturday night, we've got this great group. And this is genius, Scott, because people can come to the Saturday night service. And then they can go to a life group right afterwards. A life group, it's a potluck life group. With Dave and Angela Brigham in, they're going to go through the book of a season. Who doesn't love potluck, Scott? There you go. I All the culinary delights of potluck. Yes. You never know what you're going to get. But you know that you're going to get a fantastic experience with our life groups, especially the accessible ones. Everybody can do a Saturday one, I bet, Scott. There we go. Uh, a whole bunch of others, but the Saturday ones. And I'll tell you what else is accessible. Mm. Signing up. Because we made signing up really easy. You can just go ahead and use this life group brochure. Uh, if you're here uh, in person, the paper version, fill this out, get this to us uh, today. That'd be fantastic. And you'll also find all of the life groups listed on your Terranova app or on the website. You can sign up there as well. And uh, we're getting ready for groups, Scott. About to it's going to be off. fantastic. Yep. So now's the time to jump into that. Uh, again, either on your brochure, on the app, on our website. But we'd love to see this community really dive into those groups this fall.
Again, thank you for being with us uh, either in person or if you tune in online. Again, we're just grateful to be a part of what God is doing in and through this community. And uh, like Lyle said, over the last few weeks, we've been excited just to be a group of people who go, you know what, God, we want you to use us. We want you to use us through our interactions and the way we treat people. We want you to use us through the way we're thinking and what comes out in our words. And so we're excited to dive in to part three of our series called Speak Life. Let's check it out. Welcome to Terra Nova. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Great to see you guys here uh, on uh, this beautiful, this beautiful day. And it's already been a lot of fun. And we're diving into part three of our series, Speak Life. Real quick before we jump in, though, I just got to let you know, in two weeks, uh, we're kicking off a series on the book of Revelation. And uh, we are going to dive into the historical and cultural and social and literary backgrounds of this amazing, amazing document and discover the hope-filled and challenging, like really challenging message that it had for its first century readers and hearers and that it has for us. It's going to be uh, an eight-week series. It's going to be a great series. And you might want to think about who you can invite. Maybe somebody you think, like, I think they could use this, or, or they seem to talk about this kind of thing a lot. Maybe they'd benefit from it. So that's happening in two weeks. But today is uh, part three of our series, Speak Life. Subtitle is, I love this, The Right Words at the Right Time. And I just think that would be amazing. Wouldn't it just be amazing to, to have the words that can turn a situation around, to have the right words that could turn a relationship around, that could de-escalate a conflict, that could inflate a discouraged friend or, or, or kid? Uh, wouldn't it be amazing to have the words that would take a conversation where it really needed to go most, the right words at the right time? We began the series talking about the power of our words. We looked at this great saying from one of the Proverbs. There's a collection of wise wise sayings in the Hebrew scriptures that are known as the book of Proverbs. And uh, there's this famous one that says, the tongue has the power of life and death. And that really is true, that you have the opportunity every single day with every person you meet, you have the opportunity to either hurt or to help. All day long, we have that opportunity. And I think it's something that... Um, that I tend to underestimate, or maybe that we all tend to underestimate. I think on the one hand, we tend to underestimate, uh, underestimate the negative power and potential of our words, how much damage we can do and maybe are often doing, but I think even more so, we tend to underestimate the positive potential that we carry around in our mouths, the ability to speak life to people. That's incredible. And so, uh, so we kind of started out talking about that, but last week we said uh, wanting to say helpful words isn't always enough. Wanting to say helpful words and not hurtful words isn't always enough because sometimes my unhelpful words are not so much a matter of my intentions, but my ignorance because we all can relate to times when we meant to be helpful, right? We thought we were being helpful. We intended to be helpful. And it turned out that the words we used were really not very helpful at all. We did not have the right words at the right time. And what we thought was helpful wasn't actually helpful. And we looked at this game-changing statement from the Apostle Paul in a letter that he wrote where he says this, do not let, do not allow even a single unwholesome word word, no unwholesome talk to actually get through the lips or the fingertips, but only, only what is helpful for building others up. Every conversation is a construction site. Every conversation is a construction site. I mean, they're tearing things down or building them up. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their 
needs, according to their needs, not mine, that it may benefit those who listen. And the challenge we said with that is that we are so different. We're just all so different from one another that what might be helpful to me according to my needs might not at all be that helpful to you according to your needs. It might land on you completely differently. And we've all had those moments like, how did you take it that way? And we, so we talked about uh, temperaments, like personalities or temperaments, this color coded personality model, uh, model. And a bunch of you now have taken that test. And I've had so many conversations this week about that kind of thing. And if you're into that sort of thing, it's all very interesting. And, and it's all very helpful for awareness, self-awareness and awareness of others. That's great. But the point, even if you're not into that, even if you're not into like temperaments and personalities is this, we are all inclined naturally to say certain things in certain ways, and we are all inclined to hear or need to hear certain things in certain ways. And that means in order for me to speak what is helpful for you, in, other, in order to speak in such a way that it connects with them for their sake according to their needs, I actually need to be paying attention to them. And that is a problem. We started off this series saying that we don't always know what to say or how to say it, right? But I think an even bigger problem is we don't know what to hear or how to hear it. And that's a big, that's a big problem. Truly listening, hearing well, understanding, it is tough. It's, it's tough. And we all know what it feels like to not be heard, right? To not be understood. You're not hearing what I'm saying. You're not getting what I'm saying. We all know what that feels like. But knowing what to hear and how to hear it is very complicated. Communication experts tell us that with every exchange of words, every single exchange of words, there are actually four different layers of meaning. And every layer is a mess. Every layer is messy. Every layer is complicated. And so it starts out here. It starts out with what I mean to say. Like there's something going on in me. There's my intent, what I really need or want to convey. And already we're in deep water. Like already right there, this is tough enough because understanding ourselves, are you with me? Understanding ourselves is difficult. I don't even know what I really mean or need to say, right? In fact, there, one of my favorite Proverbs talking about those wise sayings that are found in the Hebrew scriptures says this, the purposes of the human heart are deep waters, deep waters. Now that phrase, deep waters, anytime you see it in the scriptures, the deep or that kind of language in the ancient world, deep waters was uh, the ocean, the sea. It always represented like chaos, darkness, the unknown. In other words, our purposes, our desires, our motives, our wants, our fears of our heart. It's like that. It's like there's this deep water down there. I mean, who knows what we really want? I'm a conflicted mess. I really am. I got issues. I got fears, frustrations, hopes, dreams, wants that I'm not even conscious of half the time. Some of them I'm hardly if, if ever conscious of. And then pretty much for all of us all the time, there's actually more than one thing going on down there right? There's all kinds of like, it is deep water just trying to figure out that first part, what I mean. And then we try to formulate that meaning into this series of words and phrases, which adds this second layer, what I actually say, what I actually say. Now, if you have ever listened to yourself, you know that these two are two different things, right? I mean, these are two different things. In fact, sometimes I'll just speak for myself. Sometimes I say because of like some kind of fear or anger or frustration or defensiveness, sometimes we actually say the opposite of what we really mean. Uh, we, we, we hint, we give hyperboles, sarcasm, passive aggression, accusations, finger, like feebly trying to give some expression to this emotion or this thing I'm feeling that I don't even understand, that we don't even understand. I mean, how many of us are willing to admit as we start out that often what we really mean and what we actually say are two different things. You really, you willing to admit that? Okay, like four or five of us. All right, so there we go, there we go. And then, then there's a third layer, what you hear me say. Now, at this point, like little room for error, right? Little room for error, wrong, because we listen selectively. We listen selectively. We hear what we expect to hear. We hear what we want to hear. All communication experts say this. 
We all listen selectively. We selectively pay attention to or hear or notice things based on our interests, based on our past experiences, based on our temperaments, as we talked about last week, on our current state of mind and our preoccupations and our frustrations and our emotional state, on, the, on our assumptions about the other person and what they're all about and what they're trying to do and what we expect them to say. And we listen, if we can be honest, we are often, often listening for what will make us right. What will make us wrong? We listen for ammunition. We listen for key triggers like now I've got you. We, we hear what we want to hear. We hear what we're listening for. We hear what we expect. We hear what will prove us right. We do not hear what people actually say. And then, and then the complexity doesn't even stop because the words that we selectively hear are then filtered through a series of assumptions that I already have about you and life and what's going on and the other person and what they're doing and how things are supposed to be. And through that filter, I come up with this fourth layer, what I think about what I heard you say or what you think about what you heard me say. In other words, the conclusions you draw from what you think I said and selectively heard from the words that I inadequately chose to convey meaning I'm not even sure about, filter through what you already assume to be true. And then you formulate your own meaning, which may or may not bear any similarity at all to what I actually met, and then you open your mouth and it all begins again. It truly is a wonder that we can com communicate at all. I mean, when you think about how messy and com complicated it is, it's a wonder anything ever gets meaningfully exchanged. And the, the, the thing is, we underestimate this even after we've seen or heard this kind of thing before. And that means two things. It means as people who are talking in the conversation, as the speaker, we do not adequately second guess ourselves or question what we said and the way we said it. Like, did I miscommunicate? Okay, I'm saying this, but did I clearly say what I really mean? What do I mean? What do I actually mean? Is this all of what I mean or just part? We don't question as speakers what and how we say. And then on the other side of it, as we're listening, we do not adequately question or doubt what we think we heard. We are so sure we heard what we heard and we know what it meant. And we do not doubt our ability to hear or to interpret well. We don't second guess the meaning that we added. We don't question our own filters that we all have. And Proverbs says, listen, the purposes of the human heart, friends, it's deep water down there. It is deep, dark, chaos, unknown. It's deep water down there, but, but there's hope. But there's a better way. But a person of understanding, but a person of understanding, the relationally wise, relationally astute, relationally understanding person discovers how to draw that out like like dropping a bucket deep into the water and pulling it out, how to draw out that purpose from our own hearts and from others as well. And again, nobody understood this better than this guy named James. Now in week one of the series, and if you missed week one, gotta go back and listen to week one, uh, we introduced you to this guy named James. James is a famous leader from the first century world. Even outside the Bible, other historians write about James, very famous guy. He was the leader of the Jesus community that they would have called a church, the church in the city of Jerusalem. And James led during some volatile times. It was, they were difficult times where the city of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, where he lived was, and where he led, where he was like working with people, it was on the brink of civil war and revolution. It would happen a few years later. James himself would be killed like two years after this letter that he writes and then the civil war and this revolution break out but it's just brewing it's brewing the whole time and, and everyone he's just looking around and like everybody everyone is being so quick to speak and so quick to spew and so quick to anger and so slow to listen and slow to understand sound familiar sound may be relevant to our world, yeah, and he's just watching, he's watching words, the power of words, of rhetoric and propaganda and polarization and demonization destroy the fabric of his people. It's burning the whole thing to the ground. And so James writes a letter to him, 
to the followers of Jesus a letter that I think is just so particularly relevant right now today. And he starts out this letter talking about the extreme difficulties that they are all experiencing, this season of trial that they're in, and that even though it doesn't come from God, God is up to something good in it, in us, through it. If we respond appropriately, God is doing something that things are bad, but God is good. And he starts out the letter like that. And then after making that point, he writes this. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Literally, it's know this, like get this, circle it, highlight it, asterisk it, underline it. Take note of this, everyone. Like, James, who are you talking to here? Like, because I'm pretty sure you're talking to my brother. I know you're talking to those people who hold those points of views. Like, who are you, who are you talking to here? And James is like, I'm talking to you. The, the modern uh, interpretation of this would be all y'all. It would be like, there's you and then there's all y'all. This is an all y'all, right? This is everybody, every single one. While you're looking at them, I'm talking to you. Everyone, he says, should be quick to listen. Quick to listen, which doesn't even make sense, right? Like, how do you listen quickly? How do you speed up your listening? How do you, how do you listen quickly? In other, in other words, here's what he's saying. This is your first priority. This is your first priority relationally. This is your first priority conversationally. The number one thing you do first, you listen, and you're quick to do it. You're quick to do it. Don't rush to judgment. Rush to listen. Don't jump to conclusions, jump to listen. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. I want to listen better. Before I do anything dumb, before I say anything dumb, before I go running off at my mouth, make sure I've listened and I've heard and I understand. Everybody, be quick to listen and then slow to speak. Slow. I'm rushing to listen. I'm dragging my feet to speak. I'm rushing to listen. I'm dragging my feet to speak. I'm like, I don't know if I really need to say this right now. I don't know. I'm going to bite my tongue. I'm going to think a little bit more about what I actually mean. And if these words are, are helpful for that, I'm going to hold off. I've written this email. I've written this text. I'm not going to send it. I'm just going to sit on this a little longer. I am going to drag my feet to speak. Why? Because I'm stepping into deep water. This is deep water right here. There are multiple hurdles between me and you and between what I think you might mean and what you might actually mean. It is deep water. And, and this is the genius of this is that James could just see that. He could just see that in every single conversation, in every single conflict, we all want the same thing. Every single conflict, every single conversation, we all want the same thing. You know what we all want? To be heard. That's what we want. And even more than that, to be understood. See, I want you to be quick to listen and slow to speak with me. And you want me to be quick to listen and slow to speak to you. And we may never agree, but at least listen to me. We may not agree in the end, but at least listen to me. We may never agree about how to parent our kids because like our personalities are really different and we, we have some different ways of looking at things, but at least listen to me. We may never agree about this decision at work, but at least listen to me. We may never agree about what I should major in, mom, dad, but at least listen to me. We may never agree about whether he's right for me or whether she's right for me, but at least, at least listen to me and listen to understand. And if you're gonna say something, please say something that lets me know you heard me that you hear me, that you understand one of the most life-giving things we can ever say to someone. One of the most life-giving things that we say, and, and, and there might be some people in your life right now who need to hear this, is this. I hear you. You know what? I hear you. I know you're trying to make this point. I've resisted it. I hear you. To be able to say that and for them to know it's true. Now, if you're quick to listen, slow to speak, then what comes next is a lot easier. He says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, now being slow to anger is actually the result of being quick to listen and slow to speak. Did you know that? So uh, if I'm trying to understand where you're coming from, 
trying to understand. I'm quick to listen. I'm asking questions. I'm trying to get to your side of this. As I'm trying to understand where you're coming from, I am way less likely to be all angry and venomous, even if in the end, I don't really agree with you. In other words, the longer you listen, the more you learn, the less angry you'll be. That's the, that's the formula. The longer you listen, the more you learn, the less angry you'll be. The longer you listen to your teenager, the longer you listen to your mom, the longer you listen to your sister-in-law, your spouse, the longer you listen, the more you learn, the less angry you be, the better questions you ask, the more you get them and what's actually going on, the less angry you will be. Because, and here's something we talk about all the time, it's just so incredibly true. Everything that everyone does makes sense to them. You figure that out by now, right? In fact, we've talked about it a number of times around here. Everything everybody does makes sense to them. In their story, what they're doing and what they're saying, everything that they're doing and everything they're saying, it totally makes sense to them. And what you're doing and what you're saying makes sense to you. And this is true even when, when we know we're a little out there, right? It's like, I know this is kind of stupid and I'm going off the deep end and I probably shouldn't do this. But even then, I got a story that makes sense of that. But this is different, but it'll, everything that everybody is doing, it somehow makes sense to them. And here's what that means. This is just like, this just light all of us up. If someone you know is saying and doing something that sounds crazy, that just looks crazy, but you know it makes sense to them, that should make you curious. That should make you really curious, right? And the crazier you're there being, the more curious you're like, that is the nuttiest thing I've ever heard or seen. How does that make sense to them? I've got to hear the story. This is going to be a crazy story. I have got to hear this story. I am suddenly becoming so curious about how this makes sense to you that I want to listen to you. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and therefore you will be slow to anger. And here's why. And it may not be the why you think. Like then, then you'll get people on your side and you'll convince them quicker. Here's what he says. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Literally, Human anger does not produce God's righteousness. It do, it, and this word righteousness, this is a super important word. In fact, if you follow along in your Bible, maybe the outline or something, just circle that or, or, or you know, underline it a certain or, or something. Their word for righteousness was very different than our word, I think, in many ways. It was a very multifaceted word in their language. It was actually their same word for justice. Now, in our language, to us, those two are, are, are different ideas, right? So justice is like social, horizontal, communal. Righteousness is more like personal, moral, vertical. But for them, the two were actually the same. They were part of the same idea. And righteousness for them was basically this. In fact, often we'll say that, uh, that a simple definition of sin is everything that's wrong with me and everything that's wrong with the world. And righteousness is the exact opposite. Everything's right with me and everything's right between me and the world. It's, everything's right in me. Everything is right between me and God. Everything is right between me and other people and with the world. And so it's like, it's justice, it's reconciliation, it's redemption. I'm the kind of person who does the right thing. Even when it hurts, even when it's really hard, I just do the right thing. And I'm the kind of person who makes things right. Even when it's hard and costs me and it's difficult, that's what righteousness is. Is. And he says, listen, human anger does not bring that about. It just doesn't. It doesn't bring about the righteousness that God desires. And one of the most destructive things that can ever happen is for a person to begin to equate their anger and their righteousness with what God desires. And James is watching that happen all around him in his world. He's watching that happen and we're watching it happen as, as, as well. And James says, that's, that's not the, the kind of righteousness that God would like. Don't, don't ever make that mistake. Your anger does not produce the righteousness or the rightness that God desires. You know what the rightness I desire is? Here's the rightness I desire. I know I'm right and I want you to know I'm right. That's the rightness I desire. That's my rightness, right? I know I'm right, and I, know you, I, and I want you to know I'm right. And so if I do any listening, it's to prove that you're wrong so I can be right, and I can use that against you. And James goes, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the right rightness. You don't have the, right, you don't have the rightness that God desires. See, 
we want to be right at each other. God wants us to be right with each other. We want to be right at each other because I know I'm right and I want you to know I'm right and you know you're right and you want me to know you're right and we want to be right at each other and God wants us to be right with each other and the big beautiful theological word for that that's used sometimes in the scriptures is reconcile. God wants to reconcile us to each other and he wants to reconcile us to himself. God wants us to be right with each other and our anger will never accomplish the rightness that God desires. And if we're honest, it doesn't really accomplish the rightness we desire either. I mean, does it? Like, does it ever really work that way because I knew I was right and then you knew I was right too? I mean, how often does that actually happen? Because here's what we all know. We all know this. We can be right and right and right and right and right and we can write the other person right out of the relationship. Isn't that true? We can be so right all the time, just so right, right, and we can write the other person just right out of the relationship. Parents, you know this is true. We can write our kids right out of the relationship. And you got your big bucket of wisdom and your big bucket of rightness and your big bucket, and I do. Like, I'm, I'm older than you. You don't even have a frontal lobe yet. And I got more wisdom and I got more experience. So you stand still and I'm gonna dump my bucket of rightness on you. And where are you going? Why don't they ever wanna talk to me anymore? Why do they say I don't understand them? What's going on? And we can write our kids right out of the relationship. Spouses, yeah, like we can write our spouse right out of the marriage, right? Like just like, and I won and I knew I was right and I proved I was right. And where is she? Left. She's gone because I write, I, I can write myself out of a job. I can write myself. We can just write and write and write and write ourselves right out of a relationship. And that's not the rightness that God desires. And so James says, therefore, now this gets really interesting. This gets beautiful. Therefore, let me bring it home for you. Let me bring you home and make a point. Therefore, he says, get rid of all that filth. Get rid of, take it off like old dirty clothes. And he actually uses right here, if you were here last week, he uses the exact same word that Paul used in, this, in the letter that we looked at last week, that exact same term, that exact same idea. And it's this picture of transformation that was super common for the first followers of Jesus. They, they use this language all the time. That it was like, it was like shedding, shedding our old self and our old ways was like taking off old dirty clothes and getting rid of them. And he says, therefore, Get rid of all that filth. Like, what? Oh, oh, yeah, that righteousness that you feel so right about, that you're so sure of. You know how God looks at that? Like filthy old dirty clothes that we need to get rid of. Get rid of all that filth and the malice the ill will, the desire for comeuppance, that they will someday get theirs. You take all of that ill will that he says is so prevalent. The ubiquitous malice, it is so prevalent in the world around us and it certainly wasn't. He's watching this polarization happen because of anger and malice. And he's like, you gotta get rid of that. And he, he equates our unwillingness to listen and our being so quick to speak and, and, and to anger and filled with our own self-righteousness and, and malice and anger. And he equates all of that with filth, with filthy old dirty clothes. He's like, ooh, you gotta, you gotta take that. And James is like, you're walking around with your I'm right coat. Like, I'm right. You're like, you're dressed up in your I'm right coat and you're so proud of that I'm right coat and you can't even see how filthy and ugly it is. He's like, oh man, you gotta take those old clothes off. You gotta get rid of them. Get rid of the filth and the malice. They're so prevalent. And here's our key word, humbly. That's the word we've been missing so far, humbly. Humbly, except all of that pride, all of that pride that keeps me from listening, that keeps me from wanting to put in the extra work to really try to understand you, all of that pride that keeps me from really listening to you also keeps me from receiving God's words. E even when I think he's on my side, and I'm sure he's on my side. In fact, there's this constant th theme throughout the, the long narrative of the scriptures that you cannot be right with God and wrong with people. You cannot be right with God and wrong with people. And the moment I think I can be right with God and he's good with me, but I am wrong with you and I'm good with that, I have completely missed the point, right? I've completely missed the boat. He says, humbly, that's key. 
Humbly, humbly accept the implanted word. Let it grow, nurture it. Let God do in you what he wants to do, which can save you or literally save your soul. That's the actual phrase, which can save your soul, meaning not your internal soul. That's not how they use that word. It's your right now soul. It's your life. Your soul is your life. It's yourself, which can save your marriage. It can save your character. It can save your future. It can save your friendships. It can save your job. It can save your kids. Humbly, humbly, humbly accept the word that God wants to implant in you and let it grow. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Let everyone, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The only way for me to know or have the right words at the right time for you according to your needs is to pay attention to you, to actually pay attention to you, to slow my roll, to slow my roll down long enough, jump into conclusions, I already know what you mean, slow my roll down long enough to listen and understand and ask better questions and see things from your point of view. It's the only way. Uh, uh, I don't know um, if, you, if you play golf, any golfers, uh, or, or if you ever watch golf. I, I've talked about this a couple of times because it's, it's a good illustration, I think, to me, and other people have said so, but I don't really play golf, and uh, I don't think anything I've ever done on a golf course would be called playing golf. I mean, I've walked on a golf course, and with a stick, hit balls in various directions, but uh, I wouldn't really call it playing golf, but, but some of you play golf. I have friends that play really well, and, I, and I've watched golf because it's, it's good uh, if you need to take a nap, and so... Uh, uh, and, and so I've seen people do this, and I know, I, I know you've probably seen this as well. If you've ever noticed people who really know how to golf, and sometimes people who don't know how to golf, they'll do this too, because I've done this. Uh, they're, they're, they're ready to putt, and what they do, you see what they do? They'll, they'll squat down, right? They'll like get really low, and it, I've done that before. I don't even know what I'm looking for. I have no idea, but it's like when, it, you know, if you're a guy, you know this. If your car breaks down, what do you do? You pop the hood, and you stand and stare at it. No idea what I'm looking for. I'm just hoping maybe something just absolutely blew up and exploded. So I, oh, it must be that. I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm squatting down, or you've seen people do this, and they're like looking at the grass and the terrain, right? And then you know what they do next? You've seen people do this. They'll get up. They'll walk all the way around to the other side of the hole. It's the same putt. It's the same grass. It's the same terrain. Nothing has changed. And they'll squat down again on the other side of this and look at it from the other side. Why? Why, why, why would you do that? Isn't it the same? And the answer is, and you kind of all know this probably, because she might see something or he might see something from the other side that will change the way she approaches it from this side. And I think I see so clearly on my side. I already see. What else could there be that I don't see from here? But I might notice something on this side that will change my approach from that side. And I won't see it until I take the long walk around. Until I take the long walk around. And the word we use for that, the common word for that, is this word right here, empathy. Empathy, that's the word we have for that. Psychology Today describes empathy. I love this this description. The experience, and I think that's a great way to put it, it's the experience of understanding another person's condition, not just their words, but but their condition from their perspective, from their perspective. I place myself on their side of the putt, so to speak, in their shoes to try to use my imagination, like how would I feel to try to see what they see, to try to feel what they feel, seeking somehow to understand I take the long walk around. I take the long walk around to see the conversation from their side. That's empathy. Now, incidentally, Just to add a little fuel to this, this is exactly what God has done for us. This is exactly what God has done. In fact, in one of his letters, the Apostle Paul writes this, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. That that God packed all of himself into human form, was pleased to live in Christ, and by him God, here's our word again, reconciled. He made things right. God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace. 
He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. That's what was happening the night that Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified. And then he goes, and by the way, that includes you. That includes all of us who were once so far away. He goes on to write, he has brought us back as friends. He has reconciled us through his death on the cross in his own human body. In other words, God became one of us in order to make things right with us. God became one of us in order to make things right with us. Talk about the long walk around. Talk about the long walk around to the other side. And then God says, your turn. Your turn, John, your turn. You, now you do what I've done. You do that for others. Now you love as I've loved you. you do, now you pay that forward. You're like that with everybody else. Can you see why James, who actually witnessed this, who saw the Messiah, who, by the way, was his brother, and he didn't believe that until after he saw Jesus risen from the dead, and he saw a, a crucifixion with his own eyes. You can see why he might be so incredibly passionate about this. Like, how can people who call themselves Christians, you know what that means, right? I am a, I am a person of the Christ. We are people of the Christ, the Messiah. How can people who call themselves the people of the Messiah be so unlike the Messiah? Can you even say that? Now, uh, next week, don't, don't miss next week. We, next week, we're going to talk about perhaps the most life-giving thing that we can ever say to anybody and why we so often do not say it. So don't miss next week. But today, I want to end with three quick points of practical application very quickly just to bring this home for us because here's the deal. If that model of communication that I hinted about earlier at the top, those layers of meaning, right? There's four different, if that's correct, and I hope you're kind of like, okay, I can see that. Like, I do not always put my meaning in the best words. In fact, I don't always know what I mean. And I don't always hear exactly what people say. Okay, and I definitely don't know if I think about, it. if we kind of acknowledge that that's true, then what comes from that is important and essential for being people of relational intelligence. And not only that, it's important and essential for being followers of Jesus, followers of this Messiah. So really quick, three quick practical points. If what we said is true, then the first practical point is this. I just got to assume all the time, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you're trying to say. I don't know what I heard. I'm not clear on that. I don't know. This is the humility step. I love this line from another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. This is a great line. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. I know, I know, I know. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And then he says this, those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. I gotta admit, I, I, I don't know. I gotta, st I gotta start now. This, this is gonna be really hard to admit sometimes, particularly in a conflict. I think we all at times suffer from what I refer to as delusions of omniscience. We are so incredibly, unbelievably sure, and I'm right with you, that we actually do know what's going on in other people's heads. We don't even know what's going on in our own head, right? We actually believe we know what's going on in that stranger's head and why they just did that. We think we know what's going on in the heads of our friends, our roommates, our enemies, our spouses, our coworkers, our neighbors. The greatest barrier to listening is believing that you already know. And so I just gotta stop and say, I don't know, smart, relationally intelligent people, people of understanding, remember Proverbs, the person of understanding draws it out, they assume the two things are always true. I got filters, my filters are wrong. That's always true. I got filters, my filters are wrong. There are things that, I, my, my filters between what you're saying and what I'm hearing, I got filters that kind of, I get selective, I got filters about what the assumptions I'm making and my leaps of distraction and I'm putting things together in my mind in ways that make sense to me, but it's all working its way through my filter and I'm telling myself stories about you and what's going on. I got filters and my filters are wrong. They're either partly wrong or completely wrong, but they're never all right. I've got filters and my filters are always at least partly wrong, if not way, way wrong. And so I just got to assume I need to listen a little bit more because I don't know. And, and, and having assumed that, this, these next two points are really kind of part of the same thing. I, I say this, this, I've said this so many times uh, and people like question this. this. Here's what I mean by this. Forget about the words. Here's what I mean. Just forget about the words. The truth is 
Words are vehicles of meaning, right? That's all they are. I'm trying to put some words to something I'm thinking, but what we know is that words are very inadequate vehicles of meaning because I'm often saying things that don't adequately convey the meaning that I have. Uh, in fact, words sometimes have little or nothing to do with our meaning. Isn't that true? Take, for example, the phrase, never mind, I'll do it myself, which almost never means, never mind, I will do it myself. It almost always means some variation of, I do mind, and I wish you had done it and done it the right way and the way I asked you to, but now I'm going to do it, and I'm going to mind when I do it, and by the time I'm do done doing it, you're going to mind that I did it too. Never mind. I'll do it myself. What does that actually mean? What is the meaning that's being conveyed with those words? And here's the deal. Though we know that words sometimes do not adequately convey meaning, we are always focusing on and arguing and quibbling about words. Your wife says to you, you're never home. Your boss says to you, you're always late. Your teenager says to you, you don't understand anything about me. And if you begin to quibble over those words, listen, if your boss tells you you're always late and you carefully remind them that a week ago Monday you were on time, it is not going to be helpful. That's not going to be, right? And if your, if your wife tells you you're never home or your teenager tells you you don't understand anything about me, you got to take a big step back and go, whoa, deep water. This is deep water. There's meaning there. And I can argue about always or never, but quibbling over words and the accuracy of words in moments like that is not only not helpful, I will be missing the point and I will be missing the meaning and the meaning, that's what matters. So don't focus on words, focus on meaning, focus on meaning. This person of understanding that draws out, that drops my, my bucket deep down in that dark water and draws meaning out. You remember our picture of those four layers? A person of understanding, their number one objective in a conversation is not to focus on words and argue over meanings of things. No, 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 no. It's not to listen for what I already believe and what I can use against you. No, 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 no. Our number one objective, our number one priority, quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak. Our number one priority is to discover and draw out the meaning. Like somehow with our minds, like if we can, if we can reach through all of those barriers, past what I thought I heard and what you, the words you used to inadequately convey, what you probably meant, to reach through all that somehow with my imagination and with good listening skills to discover your heart, your meaning, what you really meant. The purposes of the human heart are deep waters. But gosh, a woman of understanding... She can draw that out. A man of understanding, he can draw that out. And don't you want to be that woman? Don't you want to be that man? One of the most life-giving things you will ever say to people, and it is always the right thing to say at the right time, or often is, is I hear you. You know what? I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. To say that and for them to know it's actually true. Now, that's smart. But if you're a follower of Jesus, there's one more reason to do this. Because that's exactly what God has done for us. For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. God crammed all of himself into a human life, took the long walk around into our story to see it from our side, to be in the story with us, not just to understand it, but to actually heal it to mend it, to bring us back together again, to restore that relationship with you. And when you seek to listen and you seek to understand and I seek to maybe even mend conflict with the other person, you know what we're doing? We're doing the stuff of God. We're doing for others what God has actually done for us. And by the way, I'll just end with this real quick. If your relationship with your heavenly father feels kind of distant today, kind of far away if you're honest, maybe you've never really even said yes to that. You've never even opened yourself up to that. Or maybe if you were honest, you'd say, there have been times in my life I actually felt like I was close to God, but that was a while ago. And man, I've taken some left turns and some things have happened and I, I don't feel like I'm there now. I just want to say, as we wrap up, today is a perfect day for you to say yes to God. 
your heavenly father. Today is a perfect day to be reconciled. It's what he's all about, to begin or renew a relationship with your heavenly father. So I'm gonna throw a prayer up here. And it's a prayer I'm gonna invite us all to pray together if you're willing to pray with me. And the prayer just says, Heavenly Father, thank you for paving that re- the way for that relationship. If you took that long walk around, I don't wanna be far away from you anymore. I really don't. Please take me back as your son. Take me back as your daughter. Forgive me. Forgive me completely. And then would you please unleash your power in me to change me and give me new life. Would you be up for praying that prayer out loud together? I don't want to force you to say anything you don't want to say, but if you are, let's pray this prayer out loud together. Will you say it with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for paving the way for relationship between us through Christ. I don't want to be far away from you anymore. Please take me back as your son or daughter. Forgive me completely and unleash your power in me to change me and give me new life. Heavenly Father, that's our prayer today. We are just so grateful for what you've done to make that that wide open road between us and you to make things right with us. And I just pray for all of us as we talk about listening and the, the myriad of different relational contexts that all of us have, that you would give each one of us in this room the ears to hear what we needed to hear, today and the wisdom, the wisdom to know what to do with it. And then would you please give us the courage and the grace this week to put one foot in front of the other and take action on what you're saying to us. And I pray that in Jesus name. Amen. Uh, Well, hey, thanks again for being here real quick. Before you take off, love to get those connect cards from you, whether you're filling them out online or physically in paper. Uh, Our guest services team will be at the door. You can drop this in the offering basket at the door. You can also drop offerings in the offering basket. That kind of makes sense. I will be giving another Be Rich update next week. Uh, But if you're giving to Be Rich, you can let us know that or just general offering, whatever you're doing. Uh, You can also drop, uh, the guys are telling you about this life group brochure. If you started to fill this out, you can drop that whole thing in the offering basket. What you don't want to drop in the offering basket are these two cards right here. This is something you want to take around with you. And if you see somebody who could use a meal and it doesn't mean they're homeless or it's just, hey, hey, I want to invite you to do this. Anybody who, who could use it's going to be free. It's great food. It's every Monday night, open to everybody. It's going to be right here. Uh, invite them along. There's more cards out in the lobby if you think you might like want to grab five or six of them and carry them around with you. And then finally, stop by the Kids Feeding Kids table. Guess when Kids Feeding Kids is? Next weekend. Oh, it's next Friday night and Saturday morning. This is the last time you'll have uh, a chance, at least here, to sign up for it. You can sign up for it online too. But stop by the table. You can sign up for the Friday night or the Saturday morning and then uh, join us next weekend. It's gonna be great. As we wrap up our series, speak life, the right words at the right time with one of the most life-giving things you can ever say to anybody. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next weekend.